Spring is just around the corner. How many are ready for spring? How many are ready for, ready for the end of COVID? Amen. Let's believe God. There is no rock. There is no God. Yeah. 
And so let's believe God for that. We want to pray for those who have fallen away from Christ and backslidden, that God will help them to uh, recover themselves, to repent and return to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pray for our lost loved ones. Amen. Those who are not saved, our children who uh, are prodigal, uh, turned from the faith, that God will help them to return to Jesus. Amen. Uh, we want to believe for God for them. Pray for our nation for revival. Amen. That God will visit America again. That he'll pour out his Holy Spirit in all the churches. Amen. That he'll save those who are lost. Amen. Uh, help them uh, to uh, repent. Amen. Set the churches on fire for Jesus. Amen. Amen. We believe God for that. Uh, also, uh, we want to pray for our nation, our leaders, our national leaders. Pray for our president. Amen. For our all those who are in government, they need our prayers. Amen. That will help them, save them, and help them to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, we want to believe God for that. Uh, we want to pray as well uh, for our uh, uh, men and women in the military, uh, those who are in harm's way. Pray for those uh, uh, law enforcement personnel that uh, serve and protect us. Amen. Pray for our uh, first responders as well. God's covering salvation for all of these strength to do their jobs well. And then, and then we want to pray for all the churches for God's grace and blessing. Amen. And all the churches, uh, our fellowship uh, around the world, uh, missionaries. Amen. Pray for our leaders, Pastor Greg Mitchell, Pastor Harold Warner, and all the leaders of our fellowship. God's covering and grace upon them. Amen. Strength to do his will. We also want to lift up those who are sick in body. God's uh, covering on them. Pray for our sister Caroline, for God to strengthen her, help her, amen, so she can come back to church, amen. amen. Sister Sue Lewis as well. We want to pray for her, for God's strength. Uh, Joni Amos needs healing in her body, amen. We're praying for uh, Jeff uh, Sirwinski uh, for healing. Pray for our sister uh, um, Norma tonight. God's healing in her body. Cheryl Stutzman uh, is, is, uh, is uh, close to... Uh, to death, and so we want to pray for this man for salvation, strength, uh, amen, and who knows, God could do a miracle, so let's believe God for that, uh, uh, that he would serve the Lord, amen, and make heaven his home. Uh, Robert Lazos needs healing, we're praying for him, also for Mateo and Montana Madrid for salvation, amen, God to work in their lives, and uh, that God would uh, save Isaiah Sotelo, amen, and uh, also, uh, Jessica, believing God for them as well. Amen. So let's uh, uh, let's believe God together. How many of you have a prayer request? You can lift your hand and we'll believe God with you for your needs. Amen. So let's pray. Let's uh, cry out to God together. And then as we subside, uh, Brother Otto is going to open up the service. So let's believe God together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence, Lord. We ask you, God, that you would visit us tonight, Lord. Pour out your spirit uh, in this assembly, God, be glorified according to your mighty power. Visit us with grace and mercy, Lord God. Uh, Lord, we're asking for anointing and blessing upon uh, your people and your church. God, we pray for our nation that you would bring revival. God, forgive us our national sins, Lord God, and cleanse us and bring revival. Visit this nation, God, once more, God, in revival, Lord God. The Holy Spirit of God, we thank you for your presence in this place tonight. We ask that you would move by the power of your Spirit upon those that are sick and infirm. Father, that you would heal them and make them well, Lord God, that uh, you would save souls, touch hearts and souls and lives in Grand County. Father, in our nation, my Lord Jesus, we need revival. We pray for our leaders, Lord God, that you would uh, have them lead in the fear of God, Lord Jesus. Father, let people start to, start to turn to you, Lord God. Start to put their faith and trust in you, Lord Jesus, for all that you're about to do. Father, that there would be a powerful anointing upon the preaching of the word of God tonight. Uh, that each and every one of us would leave here different than we came. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. You turn and wave at someone. Let them know you're glad to see them. We're going to sing, I will praise the Lord. Amen. I will praise the Lord.
service. We're very blessed to be together uh, in this place, worshiping our God together. Amen. God's so good to us. Hallelujah. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, first of all, a reminder that we have prayer here at the church. Amen. Weekday mornings from, from 7 to 8. Amen. And then uh, uh, on, on Sunday this week, we're going to be having a, a guest speaker, special speaker, uh, Pastor Chayo Perez, amen, from the, our church in Albuquerque, that uh, uh, we're, uh, he's going to come, amen, and preach for us both services, so that will be a great blessing, amen. We look forward to that, and I uh, believe God for good things, amen. And so then on, um, we do have Sunday school at 9.30, so we're, we've been uh, talking about the blessing of God, amen. And so how many know God wants to bless us? Amen. 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 And so yeah. you come and you'll be blessed. Hallelujah, you hear uh, what you have to do to walk in the blessing of God. And I really do believe God wants to bless his church and multiply. Amen. Um, so uh, let's see what else. Um, a reminder that uh, uh, you know we're coming up to, to uh, Easter Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Amen. We've got a lot of special things going on this year. Last year, you know, COVID had hit and and uh, for the whole year, it seemed like we didn't do anything, but we're not going to let that happen this year. Amen. We're going to do something for Jesus. And so we've got uh, the, the special things we have planned are, are uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, walking path of the, of the um, uh, stations of the cross and the, the road uh, to salvation called the Roman road. That's going to be going on uh, the first, second and third uh, of April. Praise God, and uh, so that's coming up, and then uh, there's gonna, we're going to have our special service on Sunday uh, for res the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. There's going to be a, an Easter egg hunt and treasure hunt, and so there's a sign-up sheet on the back if you want to bring uh, boiled eggs, uh, colored eggs uh, for that, amen. And so, uh, praise God, everybody can be involved, and uh, it's a good time to invite people to come to church, amen. And so, praise the Lord. Then in, uh, as we look into April, at the, at the uh, end of April, we're going to be uh, gearing up for our uh, harvesters homecoming, amen, where the, the, the uh, other churches that are connected to Silver City, their daughter and granddaughter churches, and there's one great granddaughter church now, amen. Uh, these folks are coming uh, at the, uh, the last weekend in April. And so start praying for that. That God will bless the Harvesters Rally. We got a new banner that's coming. And so we'll have those uh, that up pretty soon. Amen. As we go forward for Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so praise be to God. Let's see. I think that's all the announcements for right now. Uh, we want to go ahead and take a few moments to receive our offering. So let's thank God as our ushers come. privilege to give to the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, you know, this is, uh, this is, we're right in the middle of, of what has come to be known as tax season. And uh, this is where we get to, to uh, support our government <laughs> with our, with our taxes. We pay income tax. And anyway, I was listening to a sermon uh, yesterday uh, by uh, Reverend Billy Graham, the late uh, Billy Graham, and uh, he preached a, a powerful message on conscience. And I thought, wow, that's a great sermon. Uh, but he mentioned something and reminded me of a story. Uh, he mentioned something that is called the conscience fund. How many have ever heard of that? And uh, it reminded me of a man who, who was feeling guilty because he did not pay all of his taxes. He cheated on his taxes. And so uh, he felt bad. And so he sat down and he wrote out a check and a letter uh, to the IRS and, and, and basically said, I, I, you know, I cheated on my taxes and I feel guilty about that. And so, so here's a check. Uh, I'm sending, I'm sending uh, half of what I ripped off. And, and uh, as he concluded his letter, he said, and if my conscience is still bothering me, I'll send you the other half. And so, 
So I'm like, well, okay, you know, you're you're uh, you're kind of doing what's right, and uh, that's okay. But I just want to encourage you as a Christian that when we come to church and we give to God, you know what? Uh, we give to Him because of he, of the fact that He's given to us. And uh, you know, we're not. This isn't about guilt. It's it really is though about doing what's right. Amen. And if you do what's right. You don't have to have a guilty conscience. Right, right. Amen. And, and see, God watches and God sees. And, you know, he sees the heart with which we give. Amen. Yes, amen. And he sees whether as we give, is it is it, you know, grudgingly and saying, oh, man, it's time for offering again. Here we go again. Or are we giving with a gladness and a joy? for the fact that Jesus did so much for us, amen. And I want to encourage you amen. that it's important for us to have a right attitude. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver, amen. Someone who's glad to give, praise God. And so that means that if that's our spirit, God loves it when we do that, amen. amen. He doesn't love us any less if, if we are grudging in our giving, but he loves us more when we have a good spirit, a good heart, because we love God. And so all we're doing when we give to the Lord, whether it's paying our tithe or giving to world evangelism or giving an offer, a special offering for Easter or whatever, uh, for the outreaches and so forth, all we're doing is reciprocating. In other words, we're, we're, we're saying, yes, God, I, I know what you did for me and uh, I'm glad to be able to do something for you. Amen. Yeah. And so let's, Let's uh, give with that spirit tonight. As we go forward in our Christian walk, let's give with a, a joy and rejoicing and gladness, amen, for what God has done, amen. So let's pray. Let's ask God to bless our offering. Our heads are about Brother Michael. Will you ask God to bless this offering? Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we ask you to bless this offering tonight, Lord. We thank you for all you're doing for the church, Lord. We thank you for this day, Father God. We ask you to bless the ill, Lord. Heal them, Father God. We ask you to give them the strength to get up, to come to the God's church, Lord, Father God. We thank you for our doing for us, Lord. Thank you for this day of church and more to come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Let's see. I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5 and 6. Amen. Proverbs 27, verse 5 and 6. I want to go ahead and read the scripture and then go into my introduction. Is Proverbs 27, verse 5 and 6 says, Open rebuke is better than love, carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Let me read it to you in the New Living Translation. An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Amen. 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 And so, praise God. I want to preach a message entitled, The Book of Warnings. Amen. How many know that God is our friend? Jesus is our friend. And so the Bible is a book of warnings from God to help keep us from destroying our lives and to help us to make it home. 
You know where home is? Home is heaven. Amen. Amen. If you're a Christian, your home is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And that's where God wants us to be. He wants us to spend eternity with him. Praise God. And so home is where God is. And heaven is where God is. Amen. Amen. So um, one of the great natural wonders of North America is the Horseshoe Falls on the Niagara River. Hallelujah. And uh, there are two signs located on the upper river on the Canadian side. The first sign is 3.2 miles upstream from the actual falls. That sign says danger zone. From that sign, one is in unmitigated danger. If your boat motor experiences any loss of power, you're in danger. In other words, if you don't have a mechanized boat, once you pass that point, you are in imminent peril and danger of death. Okay, the other sign is further downstream, closer to the actual falls, and it says, point of no return. And what that means is that once one passes that point, there is no possibility of rescue. Not even a high powered motor can save you. The current is so strong and fast at that point that certain death is inevitable. So those are signs on the, on the Niagara River that are warning signs. They're not there to, to uh, uh, make people feel bad. They're not there to cramp someone's style. Those signs are there to save people's lives. Amen. And I'm here telling you tonight that the Word of God is a book of warnings that God has given us to save our lives. Yes. Amen. 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 And so I want to look at the, the passage that we read. It says, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Amen. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. So a friend's warning. That's what I want to look at first of all. A person who is your friend... <coughs> who sees you in danger and warns you is indeed your friend. Amen. Amen. They care about you. They love you. They don't want to see you get hurt. And so they, they, they'll speak a warning, even if it's hard to speak that warning, even if they know that it's going to hurt you, that it's going to hurt your feelings, they'll still speak it because they care about you. Right. Amen. Amen. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know, I think of a, a, a surgeon. You know, for a surgeon to be able to, to uh, be a part of bringing healing to a person's body, oftentimes has to make incisions, That's right. cuts, wounds that are painful. Amen. If they find a cancerous uh, growth or a mass, in the body, uh, a, a surgeon, uh, they'll examine this, they'll make an assessment, and if it's possible, they will make incisions, they will make wounds to remove that from the body. And they're not doing that because they're, they're, they just love blood and they, they, they enjoy that kind of thing. They're doing it because they have taken an oath to save lives. Amen. So one who claims to be your friend and sees you in danger, but says nothing, is no friend. That's right, amen. Amen. The Bible says that is like kisses from an enemy. When I read that, I couldn't help but think of Judas kiss. We all know about Judas kiss, don't we? Yeah. In Luke 22, 47, 48, it says, And while he was still speaking, he, this is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. 
But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? This is an active betrayal. And it really brings to, to, to light the scripture in, uh, in Proverbs 27, 6. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Oh, I love you while they're sticking a knife in your back. Twisting it and taking your life. <clears throat> I thought of Joab uh, in the Old Testament who was... The, uh, the general under King David and when he heard that uh, that David had made peace uh, with Abner who was who was on the other side uh, 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 Joab uh, it gets upset and he he does he without David's uh, consent or even knowledge he sends a messenger after Abner says come back he comes back to Jerusalem and, uh, and Joab takes him aside to speak to him. And while he's talking to him, he, he, he runs a knife into his guts. That's what the Bible says. Kills him. Murders him. Acting like a friend. And so a friend, someone who really is a friend, feels a responsibility to say something. Amen. To warn you. When somebody cares about you and they see you in danger, that someone who really cares about you uh, will say something. It's like the old slogan. Remember the old slogan, friends don't let friends drive drunk? Remember that old slogan? That, you know, the idea there is that, you know, they have a sense of responsibility. It implies that, uh, that a friend's responsibility is to help someone that they consider their friend. It's as if they feel a responsibility that I owe this to you to help you or to say something about this situation. Amen. I'm, my my uh, way of saying that is in the kingdom of God, friends don't let friends go to hell. That's right, amen. Amen. <clears throat> if someone's your friend and they see you going wrong, they're going to do something to help you not go wrong. Amen. In the army, they call that the buddy system. You know, where you, you have a buddy from boot camp and, and uh, that person is going to be with you. And if you go into combat, you guys care about each other. You know, if your buddy gets wounded, you don't just leave them there and run. You, you uh, defend them. You do your best to rescue them. Amen. <clears throat> so we need to learn as individuals to recognize the warning of a friend. Amen. Sometimes if, you know, if we're not used to having people who are real friends to us, we can take their warnings wrongly. Amen. Uh, we can look at the warning of a friend who, who has, uh, you know, gotten the courage up to say something to us, and we might take that as a personal attack. Amen? Amen. What, are you, what are you saying? And they're carefully trying to help us. But we can choose to get offended or angry or defensive and even strike out at them. See, a wise person will understand, hey, this is my friend. He isn't or she isn't attacking me or trying to hurt me. He or she is trying to help me to keep me from blowing up my life. So if I can apply this broadly when I talk about the Word of God, I call this sermon the Book of Warnings. God is your friend. Amen. And God cares about you. And God wants you to make it to heaven God has given us, us this book and it often says things that we don't like. We don't want to hear that. We don't want to hear that we're wrong. We don't want to hear that what we're thinking and planning is, is destructive, self-destructive. We don't want to hear that. And that's why when we preach the gospel to people, oftentimes they'll say, I don't want to hear it. Because somehow they think that this is an attack. Oh, so you're better than me? You ever heard that one? Oh, yeah. You might have even said it. You think you're better than me. 
This is not an attack. This is to try to help. You know, I, I think of that little video. Some I showed it some years back. At uh, a little video short, short at the, at the, in the, that uh, that racing film, lay it down. Some of you might remember that. And uh, the the lady, she's driving at night, and and she runs out of gas. And and this this man, creepy looking dude, uh, is trying to uh, get to her, and she's freaking out, man. It's a it's nighttime. There's a, a moon. It's spooky. There's of course there's spooky music and all this. And so he finally grabs a rock and breaks her window and she's screaming and freaking out. And he's trying to grab her. She kicks him in the face and he rips her door open and she's trying to climb in the back seat and he grabs her by the legs and she's screaming bloody murder. She thinks, who knows what she thinks? This guy's going to kill me. He's going to rape me. He's going to do something to me. And he's dragging her out of this car. She's holding on for dear life. You know, she's holding on to the steering wheel and she can't hold on. And he pulls her out and she's holding on to the window frame of the car. And she finally, she can't hold on anymore. And he rips her away from the car and just then a train smashes the car. <laughs> and the little video ends with her like, just in shock. And all along, all he was doing was trying to save her life. But she was taking it wrong. I mean, sometimes we can take it wrong. Amen. When somebody's trying to save our lives. And we have to have the ability to discern and understand when well, this is a friend trying to help me. Amen. Amen. Let me talk to you secondly about the point of no return. As in the river in life, in many areas, there can be a point of no return. And so we have to be careful how we live our lives. There's a story uh, in July of 1960, James Honeycutt took seven-year-old Roger Woodward and his sister Deanne for a boat ride on the upper Niagara River. According to one account, he had gone past the point of no return. He tried to turn his 14-foot aluminum motorboat around, but a shear pin failure disabled the motor, leaving the boat and those in it at the mercy of the current. The boat quickly flipped over, and its three former passengers were headed for the falls. Luckily, Diem floated close enough to Goat Island that some of the tourists were able to pull her to safety. Her brother Roger and James Honeycutt were not so fortunate and were swept over Horseshoe Falls, over which 3,000 tons of water crashed every second. Miraculously, Roger survived. Sadly, James Honeycutt was battered and drowned. You know, sometimes in life, people go past that point of no return. See, the danger of miscalculating how close you are to the point of no return is very real. What I'm saying is we can miscalculate it. You know, sometimes in our minds we think, well, you know, just, just one more time. I'll just do it one more time and then I'll quit. And for some people, there isn't another time. For some people, that was the last time. See, there is a point of no return spiritually that some people will come to. The Apostle Paul wrote in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, he said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, and here's the scary part, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Their own conscience seared with a hot iron. See, sometimes we can be deceived into thinking that, well, I can, you know, I can always come back. I've seen people backslide and come back. But I've seen people backslide and never make it back. Because they just... They went past that point. 
I didn't realize it. It says that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. You know, the imagery there is of a branding iron. You know, that taking a, a glowing iron and burning the conscience to the point where it does not work anymore. Some people backslide and, and it's as if I don't care. I mean, no, if you get to a place in your life where you can sin and you don't care, you're in trouble. If it doesn't bother you to live in sin, you're in trouble. You're coming to that point of no return. Conscience seared with a hot iron. The nerve endings are so damaged that there's no feeling there. It's just numb. Very dangerous. I remember, and I, I, I'm sure I've shared this story here before, but some of you are uh, newer and you haven't heard it, so I'll, I'll share it again. One of the, the men who got saved when I got saved was a, a young man by the name of Peter Hearn. Peter was, a, you know, he was an interesting fellow. He, he, uh, you know, he got, I believe he genuinely got saved. But one of the things about Peter is that he, he was a chronic liar. And uh, was, we always catch him in lies. Uh, we lived together for a while. And, uh, you know, he, one of the things that really stands out in my memory about Peter was the day we got baptized because we got baptized the same day, and uh, and we got baptized in the hot springs up in in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and and it wasn't the cold lake like where my wife got baptized. She was jealous, but she you know what she always said? She said, "You were so bad they had to boil your sins away." <laughs> I got baptized in the hot spring, but I remember when Peter got baptized, he he was wearing one of those biker gloves because he was kind of a wannabe biker and you know the, the the gloves with no fingers you know leather with no fingers one evangelist says they have cold hands and hot fingers and so but he didn't want to get that glove wet so when he got baptized he kept it out of the water and i remember watching him he didn't put that hand under the water Peter eventually left the church. He went, moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, and began to work as a security guard in one of the casinos there. And, you know, I don't know what kind of life he was living. But then one day we got word that Peter was dead. And I was like, man, what a bummer. He was saved, serving God, now he's dead. And then we got word of how he died. You know how word always trickles in later? And you find out what happened? Well, what happened is he was, he was drunk and he had a, a revolver and was playing Russian roulette. And he, he shot himself, killed himself, playing Russian roulette. And my, my mind flashed back to that hand, unsurrendered to God, sticking out of the water. And I'm telling you that, that it is possible to go past the point of no return Amen. You know, nations can go past the point of no return. Civilizations. In Romans 1.28, we see the, the culmination of it. Because men did not want to, uh, to listen to God. They, they exchanged the truth of God for the lie, it says. And then in verse 28 of Romans 1, it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, I don't even want to think about God. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. It says, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. And then you read the rest of the chapter and they're courting the judgment of God. You know, one of our esteemed congressmen last week or the week before said, there's no place for the will of God in Congress. And I'm like, whoa. God gave them over to a depraved mind. You know what a depraved mind is? I'll tell you, uh, the King James says a reprobate mind which is a more graphic sounding word. But what it means is that you're going to have people 
who come to a place in their life where they can no longer tell the difference between good and evil. They think good is evil and evil is good. They love sin and hate righteousness. How many know that's where we are today? Amen. Crying out loud, we're, we live in a culture that is, I read an article this week and I was like, it turned my stomach. It says, we're getting rid of Dr. Seuss in the schools and we're bringing, bringing in the gay BCs. I'm like, what? We're not going to teach them about Dr. Seuss because that's dangerous. They might get uh, racist ideas from that. But instead, we're going to teach them, we're going to teach uh, uh, kindergartners and, and grade schoolers that uh, you might be gay. You might, you're, you think you're a boy, but you might be a girl. <sighs> that sounds to me like a depraved mind. That sounds to me like a reprobate way of thinking. And it sounds to me like a people that are going past the point of no return. See, if we could see where some decisions would take us, we might think about twice about making that decision. I was thinking as I thought of that, I couldn't help but think of Lot when he chose to go to Sodom. You know, there was a little conflict going on between Lot and Abraham's uh, uh, shepherds because of, of space issues. And in Genesis 13, 8, it says, So Abr Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that was well watered, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated each from, uh, they separated from each other. Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities on the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So when Lot looked over that land, it looked good to him. A prosperous city. It looked like a bright future for him and his family. But if only he could have seen where it would lead him. If only he could seen, could have seen what it would cost him. Not only him, but his entire household and all his descendants. But he couldn't see it. He didn't realize that going to that place that was full of wickedness was going to be the destruction of his life. And I tell you something that Satan will tempt you with things that look good. Amen. He'll tempt you with things that seem like, hey, that you know, man, that looks good to me. That's where we have to have discernment. That's where we need to approach life carefully. Amen. You know, one of the dangers in modern America in the U.S is the out of control spending by our government. You know, they just they just passed this last COVID bill and uh, it's gonna be signed and we're all gonna get $1,400 checks and we're okay with that, but you know, that's just a fraction of the spending that's going on. I read today that with this spending bill, with the last three Stimulus bills is over five trillion dollars. Right. We don't have a clue what a, even what a trillion is. You and I don't have a clue what a what a billion is, and we have a hard time imagining a million. You know, a hundred thousand to us is like whoa, that's a lot of money. You know, 
I remember I was talking to uh, uh, an insurance guy and you know, he asked me, well, what's your income? And I said, well, I have a six figure income, which is over, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. The only problem is it takes me four years to earn it. And so, you know, we, we would be considered living under the poverty level, but I'm not poor. But $100,000, okay, think about that. It takes 10 $100,000 to make a million, okay? A, a billion dollars is a thousand million. A thousand million, this is too big for our brains, okay? One trillion is a thousand million. It's astronomical. And right now, with the last three uh, COVID bills, we're over five trillion dollars. Well, you know, when they the term astronomical, you know where that came from? That came from astronomy. And when they looked out at the universe, they said there are too many stars to count. All we can do is get a rough estimate of how many there are. It's astronomical. Well, here's the point. The reason I bring it up is that in economics, there's also a point of no return. In other words, if they keep spending the way they are, this nation will get so deeply in debt, it cannot recover. And sometimes you could almost think that maybe that's what they're trying to do, I don't know. But we, as individuals, we can reach a level of sin in our lives that is so great that it brings us into the judgment of Almighty God. And that's really what I'm talking about. You know, there's a lot of things going on outside of that. But what you and I have to concern ourselves with is that we can come to a place where God finally says, you know what? That's it, no more. And he's done it before. In Genesis 6, verses 5 through 7, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, you know what, what those scriptures are telling us? That the earth has come to a place before it has crossed the point of no return. Where God says, that's it. I'm going to destroy this and there's not going to be any remedy for that. There is a point of no return, beloved. In Genesis 13, we read of, uh, you know, we read about Lot going to Sodom. But there came a time where God said, no more. And then in Genesis 19, we read the account Genesis 19, 23, it says, The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. Those people reached the point of no return. There was no going back. There was no more salvation. And I want to tell you something, that one day the earth again will reach its point of no return. 
Come on, Pastor. And Peter wrote in 2 Peter, he said, the earth will melt with fervent heat. All its works will be burned up. And everything that people care about on this earth today, everything they worked for, everything they gave themselves for will one day be gone. That's why as Christians, we don't live for this world. We live for the world to come, amen. We serve Jesus Christ because we know these things are going to happen. There is a point of no return. It's coming. Let me close with turning back before the point of no return. That's the point of this message. Amen. That we would turn back to God before the point of no return. And, and what that requires is that we have the ability to see the danger looming ahead. That we have the ability to read the signs. Amen. Remember, I, I, I read about the signs on the, on the uh, Canadian side uh, of the, the river, uh, the uh, Niagara River. One sign, 3.2 miles upriver, says danger zone. <laughs> and another sign closer to the falls says the point of no return. In other words, do, do not go past this point because if you do, you will die. Or at least you will go over the falls and you will not be rescued I'm short of a miracle. I read an encouraging article today on CBN. It said Governor Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas signed a law into law on Tuesday, that's yesterday, March 9th, legislation banning nearly all abortions in the state. Amen. 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 And you know, you know what it said is that, uh, that the only exception is when the life of the mother is in danger. I'm sure it'll be challenged. But sadly, there was an ironic argument from Alexis McGill Johnson, who is the president of Planned Parenthood uh, Action Fund. She said this in a statement. Uh, I, I assume it's a woman. Um, it says this, now listen to this. From a Christian perspective, I'm like, wait a minute, that's completely backwards. This is politics at its very worst. At a time when people need economic relief and basic safety precautions, dismantling abortion access is cruel, dangerous, and blatantly unjust. So I'm reading that as a Christian, and my first thought was, cruel to who? Not to the baby? Amen. That much is clear. Th this law is not cruel to that unborn baby. Amen. This law is merciful to that baby. Let me let me read her words again. This this is politics at its very worst at a time when people need economic relief. Okay, so doing away with the life of a baby is economic relief. They need basic safety precautions. Dismounting, dismantling abortion access is cruel. It's dangerous. And it's blatantly unjust. And I'm, I'm scratching my head and I'm thinking, this woman is not thinking about the life of a child. This is not cruel. This is not dangerous. This is not unjust to that baby in the womb. This is merciful. Amen. This is humane. And so I thought how blind some people are to the spiritual realities. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, Hands that shed innocent blood. 
a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift and running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among brethren. I read another article today uh, said that, uh, I don't know if he's a senator or a congressman, but Rand Paul blocked uh, in the new COVID bill, he, he successfully blocked Planned Parenthood from getting any of those funds. Thank God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 And he, he said this, he said, we're gonna be watching them because I know they're gonna try to make an end run around this and still get the funds. You know why he said that? Because they did that with the last one. They cheated and got the money anyway. In, a, in our nation, there is no fear of God where there should be. But there are still some people who see the danger. There are some people pulling back from the and turning before they get to the point of no return. Amen. That's why I read those articles. It's not a political statement at all. But there are some people who are seeing this is dangerous territory because God hates hands that shed innocent blood. He hates the heart that devises wicked plans. He hates feet that are swift to running to evil. He hates those who lie and who sow discord among brethren. That describes the political uh, atmosphere that we have right now. That's right, amen. amen. There's complete discord among, among uh, the, the people of our nation. There is such polarization right now, and that is being fueled by some... And the problem is, there's no fear of God where there should be. But there are some people who still fear God. Can you say amen? amen. And I want you to know, God takes note of those who do fear Him. Amen. In Second, uh, I'm sorry, in Ezekiel, rather. Ezekiel chapter 9. You should take some time to read Ezekiel 9 because Ezekiel 9 tells us about God bringing His judgment on a on a, a wicked city. And in the midst of this, he has a man who has a special job. And so let me read this to you. Ezekiel 9 verse 3 and 4 says, Now the glory of God of Israel has gone up from the cherub where it has been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had a writer's inkhorn at his side. Now listen to this. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within. God sees the people whose hearts are broken over the sin that's going on in their midst. They sigh and they cry. They weep because they see their people crossing the point of no return. Amen. And God says, put a mark on them. And then he sends the other men who have weapons. He said, go into the city and kill everyone who does not have that mark. God takes notice of people who fear him. God takes notice of people who love righteousness and hate sin. You know, you drive by Walmart every day for the last few weeks and you see people out there every day carrying a sign that says, pray to stop abortion. You know, and I have to admire what they're doing because they're out there rain, shine, wind cold heat and they're praying God stop this then I read articles like I did today about the governor of Arkansas who signed into law a bill that will stop nearly all abortions in their state. God, give us more people with courage like that. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And God takes notice. 
God has always called people to come out of darkness and the evil that is in this world. He's always done it. I'm going to share two more scriptures with you and then we're going to, we're going to close. Second Corinthians <laughs> chapter 9 verses 3 and 4. I'm sorry, that's that's the wrong reference. I don't know if you've written it down wrong. Let me see if it's 1 Corinthians. Oh yeah, I just said the wrong one. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. says this, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what counsel has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell with them and walk with them or walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. See, we don't have to go past the point of no return with everyone else who's going that way. Amen. The world is headed to that place where it's marked and it's once it crosses that line, there's no going back. But I'm telling you that you and I have the opportunity tonight to make sure that we don't even get close to the line. Amen. Amen. That we serve God with all our heart and all our soul. Amen. And I'm going to close with one last scripture. The scripture is quoted very often, but it's, it's an answer of God to the prayer of Solomon. Solomon prayed and he said, when, when your people sin against you, Lord, and they pray from this place to you, hear them. Second Chronicles 7, verse 13 through 15, it says, when I shut up the heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, that's for judgment. 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. <laughs> Amen. God says, if you repent of your wicked ways if you turn back to me if you humble yourselves and stop going down that path uh, i will forgive you and i will restore you and i will hear your cry amen i will listen to you and so let me close by just saying what i said at the beginning god is our friend god is our friend Jesus is our friend. Amen. Amen. And his book is a book of warnings. Not to cramp our style, not to make us feel bad about ourselves. No, to save our lives from destruction. Amen. There's a danger zone. And there's a point of no return. And I want to encourage you and challenge you tonight. Don't even get close to it. Okay. Amen. If I ever go see Niagara Falls, I guarantee you one thing, I'm not getting in the river. <laughs> Amen. I'll stand at the distance and take a picture. I want to encourage you. Don't play with your life. Don't play with your soul. It's too precious. Amen. Amen. Serve the Lord with all your heart. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God gave us this book so that we can make it home. Amen. Amen.
Let's bow our heads together. We're going to pray and thank God for his goodness. Amen. Let's, let's pray together. This evening, perhaps you've come and you're not right with God. If you're not right with God, you are in the danger zone. Amen. You are in the danger zone. Because the truth of the matter is, one day, we're all going to pass into eternity. And we have no guarantee of tomorrow. And it doesn't matter if you're young or if you're old. I've known young people that have passed into eternity. I knew a young man on his graduation night driving the brand new Mustang that his father bought him for graduation who used to be saved. He's partying, celebrating graduation and drives his brand new Mustang off a cliff. And that was his last day on earth. Went into eternity. See, none of us have a guarantee. If you're not right with God, the very best decision you can make is to give your life to Jesus and to be born again. If you're here tonight and you're not right with God, you want to give your life to Jesus, I encourage you to do it. Do it. Don't hesitate. Don't wait. Don't think to yourself, yeah, well, you know, I, I got a long time ahead of me. No, no. If you're not saved, you're in the danger zone. Tonight, God's calling you. He said, come to me. I'll give you eternal life. I'll forgive your sins. And I'll set you on the right path. I want you to make heaven your home. And if that's what you want, I'd like to pray with you. If you do, if that's what you want, you give your life to Christ. Lift up your hand and we'll pray. Lift it up and hold it for just a moment. Say, yes, Pastor, pray with me. I want to be saved. I don't want to risk my life in the danger zone. I don't want to reach the point of no return. God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. Quickly, raise your hand. God loves you. Maybe you're watching online. You know, we're going to post this a little bit later and you're watching online. You know what? You can be saved. I'm going to say a very simple prayer with you and if you if you want to repeat this with me and mean it with all your heart, and you find a good church to go to, and God will have mercy on you. He'll change your life. Say this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I know you died on the cross to take away my sins. And I ask you to forgive me. I confess that I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, come into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to serve you from now on. And I thank you for your mercy and your kindness to me. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a few minutes as we bring our service to a close. And I want to invite you to come to the altar and find a, pray, a place to pray. Maybe you... You know, you, you've been living kind of lax as a Christian. You've been, you know, kind of playing fast and loose with your salvation. You know, seeing how close you can get to the fire before you get burned. Let me urge you, amen, stay out of the danger zone and be right with God. You do not want to come to the, pl to the place of no return, amen. You don't want to come to that point, amen. And so we're going to take some time. We're going to open the altars for prayer. God's speaking to you. He's dealing with you. You get up out of your chair and come forward and you find a place to pray at this altar. God's going to meet you. Amen. He's going to help you. Praise God. Amen. We'll sing a song and worship. Amen. Here I am to worship. Amen. You come find a place to pray. Let's all stand together. The light of the world, you step down. To darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life.
spent with